sailboat navigation and communication, some dusty old equipment, and some amazing modern marine technology. So we'll start with the oldest navigation equipment on this boat and then work into the more modern electronics. But one thing that we don't have for navigation on this boat is a sextant. Maybe one day I'll certainly regret that decision if the satellites ever fall out of the sky or they turn them off or whatever. But I can tell you if we did ever have a sextant on this boat it would not be a plastic one. I sailed around the world using a plastic sextant so it can certainly be done but they're terribly inaccurate. There's a lot of problems, inherent problems with plastic sextants. They expand and contract a lot with temperature changes, upsetting all of the accuracy and uh, the alignment of the mirrors. They have very low grade optics, like for the sun shades. So it doesn't give you a crisp outline of the sun to reduce down to the horizon. It's always a little fuzzy. So you're much better off to get a metal sextant. The only other metal sextant that I have used is the Astra 3B and that's a tremendous difference upgrade in accuracy over any plastic sextant. It's the difference between a plastic violin and a nice wood quality violin. Decades ago I did a comparison between a plastic sextant and a metal Astra 3B sextant and the best I could do with the plastic sextant is to get within 4.4 miles of my known position. With the metal Astra 3B, the accuracy was 1.5 miles. The other antiquated piece of equipment we don't have is a radio direction finder. I used to use a Ray Jeff direction finder like this one. On top is a ferrite antenna which rotates, and you rotate that to get the null from the station which you're homing in on. So rather than having a real direction finder on this boat these days, what we have is this Grundig shortwave receiver that receives all the bands. But inside of here is a ferrite antenna. And I'll tune this to the AM band and pick up a station. And I can rotate this to pick up a station very clearly. And we want to rotate this ferrite antenna in here to where we get the null, the least amount of reception. So we know that the station then is either that way or 180 degrees in the opposite direction. So that's where navigation comes in, the art and science. You have to figure out all right, which way to turn. But this will do the same as that Ray Jeff radio direction finder. And we set up a compass. Of course, you have to figure out variation and deviation and all that, but you figure out the null, you figure out your compass heading to that station. So you plot that compass heading actually away from the known radio station and you'll have a line of position. You'll be somewhere on that line. Do that with two more radio stations and you'll get a nice fix to find out just where you are. Or of course you can just home in on that station and keep sailing for it until you finally knock on the door. The problem is these days there are no more that I know of RDF stations. In the old days, radio direction finding stations were everywhere along every coast. They had a three letter Morse code identifier. And you had a whole book that covered the whole world to figure out what station that is that you're picking up. Now you're gonna have to pick up AM broadcast stations and just hope that it's in a language that you understand. And when they make their announcement, their identifier, that uh, you'll know what city that they're coming from. There are also RDF stations at airports, but that's a whole different subject for another video. So we, we keep charts on board, um, large charts, and we do have some smaller scale charts. This one we use just for oh, looking ahead where we wanna go and doing some basic um, research for navigation purposes. This one covers 175 degrees of the earth. So it goes all the way from the Marshall Islands, way out in the Pacific, all the way over to the west coast of Africa. We also have another chart that covers just the Indian Ocean area. And we do have some smaller charts that'll cover more specific areas, but nothing like in the old days where every cruising boat would have stacks of charts. They would make big lumps underneath cushions in the main saloon. 
But then, of course, in the old days, everybody was trading charts, uh, trying to get charts that are farther ahead where you're going, and you trade off the ones that you won't be needing anymore. But for charting, we still keep our instruments for plotting. We have the parallel rules for walking across the chart and laying out course lines. One thing I can never understand is why the Coast Guard Auxiliary would instruct using parallel rules to walk across a chart. Um, most yachts just don't have a big area to open up a chart and walk across down to a compass rose to figure out the heading that you need or the other compass information that's required. Far better aviators, even from way back, were far ahead of the nautical navigators. They had a course plotter. This one is an adaptation for nautical use. The aviation plotter is a little smaller, much more streamlined, so an aviator can plot out on his lap and in the cockpit of an aircraft. This one is a little bigger, a little flatter. But what it does, you just lay it out. This one has a green arrow. Say like if we're, we want to go from here to here, we put this in the direction that we want to go, figure out we want to go from here to there. And then we turn this dial on top and line it up with a longitudinal line. And now we can read the course to where we want to go off the dial. They have east and west variation laid out here too, so you can read that off. And you get your magnetic variation, of course, off of the compass rows. So it's fast, it's easy, and much more practical than trying to walk this thing across a chart, especially when you're bouncing around, you know, in 45, 50 knots of wind off of wave tops. So the next piece of old equipment that we don't use anymore, but it still works, is this old GPS receiver and it gives us latitude and longitude it's an old Furuno and it's still working perfectly fine and we can also key in a latitude longitude where we want to go and it'll give us a track to head for or a waypoint to head for and like a little highway to stay on to keep on that heading um, if everything else fails we can always take the latitude and longitude off of that and plot it out on a chart my favorite depth sounder is right here. This is getting into the more modern equipment now. This is a Lorentz fish finder. It's a LMS 525. This will go down to 4,000 feet. It's my toy. Who needs to know when you're in 4,000 feet of water? But it goes down to that depth on a grade scale. That's um, and also using 50 kilohertz. Much shallower water. You want finer detail and you use a much higher uh, kilohertz which would be 200. It gives you much nicer detail at the bottom. We're only here in 13 feet of water in the marina so a nice flat surface. But I have seen volcanoes at 1800 feet deep, a perfect shape of a volcano with even the smoke coming out of it as we're moving south along the Mexican coast in the Caribbean. It's fun to watch. It's like looking out of an airplane window and seeing what's down there. But then again, you don't need to know if you're in 1,800 feet unless you're approaching shore and the depths are getting shallower and shallower. So it has been very helpful, especially sailing along some of these coasts that do rise up quickly, say like along Mexico and uh, out in the Pacific. Water temperature here in the marina is 86.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That is some of the warmest water we've seen anywhere. And of course, it does give speed through the water as well. Now we get a lot of the same information on the Ray Marine depth sounders. We have two fish finders that will give us the same color information at the bottom which will give um, a hardness whether it's yeah, you can interpolate whether it's mud or rocks. Now on the Ray Marine that will give us very similar but actually better defined information. They use a sweep of frequencies. Each finder uses a different set of frequencies. So some are higher for a much finer detail, but in shallower water, and the other fish finder will go down deeper, and, but still using a sweep of frequencies, not just a single 50 or 200 kilohertz, it'll give a much better definition of the bottom. I mean, you can see the fish down there. It won't tell you the species of the fish, but pretty close to it, I think. But I'll let Rebecca take care of that, and she'll show you the multifunction display, which is an incredible piece of equipment the Vesper AIS, which is a standalone item. I like the two different AISs. 
the single side band, which is antiquated. We really don't use that much anymore. And along with the Pactor 3 modem, and of course this VHF radio back here, which is standard equipment. And the Iridium Go satellite communications. A lot of fun toys to keep us safe. We don't have insurance on this boat, but we do invest in electronics. So as long as we don't become complacent, all the electronics will help to keep us safe. I still use the laptop for um, navigation. Not so much when we're underway, more like when we're planning and as a backup. Primarily I use OpenCPN and I have for a long, long time. The thing that I still use it for is its ability to make CAP charts, K-A-P dot K-A-P charts. And those come from Google Earth. And uh, I can zoom in on Google Earth when I have good internet, zoom in on an area and take a snapshot of it. And then overlay it into OpenCPN so that I can then look at it on OpenCPN. Look at how it changes things. So to satellite image, you can now see that we're in a marina, we're in a slip in the corner here, and it's shallow going out here with the light blue water and then it gets deeper out here. A lot of cruisers use it. It's just worth its weight in gold. So that's something that I use a lot. I still make cap charts for everywhere that we go. You can... But when we left to go full-time cruising, we decided uh, that it would be good to have not a laptop that would fall on the floor, not a handheld GPS that would fall on the floor, neither one that would run out of battery, something that was hardwired and bolted down. And that's when we got a chart plotter. Now this is the second chart plotter that we've had. But same, same place that we are, we're, we're here now. There's no big boat icon because we're standing still but we're in this marina here, or in this marina here. Now let me talk about these, these two screens. Um, I can either go a full screen like that, and I have Navionics boating. I can zoom in. Oh, we have another boat with AIS in here. Who is it? Umoja. Umoja has AIS. Okay, so what is this right here? Raymarine and specifically Navionics has a very cool feature on this on this chart plotter where it will record our depths as we go in and we can see and then it compensates for low tide so we can see that on the way out if we go out at low tide we'll see 9 feet, 7 feet, 8 feet, 9 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet, 13 as we get out into deeper water um, and you can turn that on and off so you don't always have to look at it but it's nice you make your own charts as you go um, so if you go back in that area, you know for sure what your depth sounder was recording. When I connect this up wirelessly to the internet, um, it will upload all of my tracks to the boating community, to community edits, which is a Navionics thing. And I'll be able to download all of the tracks from other people and pretty soon the whole chart the whole world will be charted by other cruisers that have gone in this area and now Nav and Navionics is so smart they know when somebody's chart when somebody's depth sounder is not working correctly and they take that out of the mix uh, they know when there's a dolphin under your boat they seem to know everything because they know just the right charts to reject and just the right charts to accept but back to the two the two charts that I had up Let me go back to that go to dual chart and you notice that I'm doing everything touchscreen because I'm used to using an iPad now and everything is touchscreen. But there, on this Raymarine chart plotter, it's kind of cool because there's all the buttons too. Um, but anyway, back to these two screens. Um, I have over here the Navionics and I have over here the Jeppesen C Maps. Can't tell you that one chart's better than the other. It's, it's, different every place you go. Usually they're the same, both are really excellent, but you do get to areas that one's better than the other and it can be. There's a 48 mile color radar on this machine and so many other features it would take way too long right now to tell you all about them. But also one thing that we don't do is integrate our autopilot into this machine. I don't want to have everything funneled into one failure point. I really do like the idea of keeping standalone equipment. And that's one reason why we have another standalone AIS. And the standalone fish finder, depth sounder, 
and just all kinds of other backup machines. The Vesper AIS is just an amazing machine. It's a small box with only four buttons, but it gives so much information to the navigator. It lets us know when ships are out there way over the horizon, and the screen goes out to 48 miles. It lets us know what type of a ship it is, its heading, its time to closest point of approach, and if it's going to be a danger to us. And we can also set up guard zones. So if a ship does come within a certain range that we predetermined, it'll set off an alarm. And that alarm we also have set up to a very loud piezo alarm. It's a freestanding alarm that even I can hear it out in the cockpit. So nothing is going to go unnoticed who breaks through that barrier. Large freighters, tugboats, large fishing boats, oftentimes in these foreign countries and far out at sea do not show AIS. International Maritime Organization laws just are not enforced in many of these foreign countries. So AIS is not a replacement for radar. And besides, radar is so helpful in bad weather and finding land when you just can't see it visually. But AIS is a great navigational safety aid. You do want a transmitter so other people can see you. And you certainly want to be able to pick up their signals, but it is not a cure-all for anti-ship collision. Um, so the laptop I have all but retired now, probably for about a year and a half, two years. And now I use the iPad um, as my primary backup. It's always the Ray Marine chart plotter that is my primary. Over the last few years, I've probably tested, I don't know, about 100 different navigation programs on the iPad. And my three favorite ones, by far, Navionics Boating is my primary. It's very similar to the chart plotter. Lose the Raymarine chart plotter, very easy to switch right over to Navionics Boating on the iPad and just pick up right where we left off. My second program that I use um, in conjunction with Navionics Boating is Ovital Map. And while Navionics Boating has Bing satellites, B I N G satellites, um, Ovital Map has Bing satellites, but also has Google Map satellites, and probably two or three others. So if one is cloudy, you know, has a big cloud over it, um, I can easily switch over to the other one in this application. So I have this running as well, whenever specifically, or more importantly, when we're going into a, a anchorage. I have it in very fine detail. I download point A to point B, um, and any detours that I might make in between, and what my third most favorite is Time Zero iBoat, TZ iBoat. That's the old uh, Noble Tech program, if you're familiar with those. Very feature rich. I don't utilize it at all to its full potential, um, but I do have it running as well because some things are a little easier to find in this than in the other applications. So I like to have all three going so that uh, if Patrick asks me a question, I know which one I can get it the quickest in go to that application and get him the answer. So those are the three that I've liked the most over the years. One thing that does remain the same from the old days to the new days is a barometer. We still have the barometer over here, but we also have the barometer on the iPad. Just like the old fashioned one, but what's real nice is it'll also give me a trend. I haven't run this for at least 30 days um, but it would give me a trend of it going up and down so I wouldn't even have to keep track of it. The barometer built right into the iPad, so I don't need internet, I don't need anything at all. It's just one of the little known features of an iPad. I give up. Shut it off. So, the SSB for voice communications, we just really don't use it much anymore and the Pactor modem for email and for weather. We just don't use it too much anymore. I don't like racing home from barbecues at the end of the day to get just the right timing to get this to work. Um, now we have a better system, way better, day or night, anytime we want it, any place we want it. Um, I just simply switch on satellite communications. There we go. And then for my email, I go to my X gate, I go to my inbox, I just ask for my email, get mail, and it gets my mail. Nice and easy, anytime, day or night. For my weather, I can just go to 
offshore weather by predict wind click on it go to grip offshore go to download sign up for what I want continue to my download download them all and the Iridium Go, as long as they're not bigger than about 100 kilobytes a piece, 150 kilobytes a piece, just downloads the mod. I like the precision of this, the ease of this, the convenience of it. Um, I don't think I could go back. So with Predict Wind, we have four different forecasts. With the SSB and Pactor modem, I used to get one forecast model. I get four forecast models with Predict Wind. And on top of that, I get three models of ocean currents almost anywhere in the world, anytime. Where else can you get that? It just doesn't get better. So Patrick and I really enjoy responding to your questions, so if you have any questions at all, just leave them down below and we'll personally respond. Patrick does have a question for you, but wait one second. Um, I have included many links down below um, for more information on the things that you've seen in today's video. And also, there's a very good link down there for a free, yes, free, no strings attached, marine electronics course. Um, so, very fitting. Okay, Patrick, I know your questions are burning, so go ahead. Well, rather than a question right away, uh, we've had some comments and some offers by some very generous people, very nice people, offering to donate to our cause, which is certainly much appreciated. We have some very expensive computers, cameras, lenses, plus all the time that it takes to put one of these videos together. It would be nice to offset those costs, but I just have a personal hesitation. I can't explain it for Patreon. I think it's a great program for a lot of people, but not for us right now. But Rebecca has put links, affiliate links, in the video description and also on our blog site, whereisbrickhouse.com. So if you need to buy any equipment, any marine equipment for your boat, if you could go through those links, it'll be a big help for all of us. And also, uh, I think Rebecca, I know Rebecca has put up some links for Brickhouse t-shirts. And so that is on our blog site, whereisbrickhouse.com as well. So if you could go that route, that would certainly be a nice help for us and we all come out ahead that way. Maybe in the future we'll do the Patreon thing, but I'd like to hold off for as long as we can. The other thing too is, I mean, all this equipment that we have here, we didn't put that on yesterday. We've been doing this for 12 years now, so it's gone through an evolution. This chart plotter, as Rebecca said in the video, is our second one. The first one was a much smaller screen, which seemed very adequate at the time, but I wished shortly after we put it on that we had put on a larger one even though it costs more but with this large screen we can see all the way out to the binnacle it's a nice piece of electronics but I do wonder what are other people putting on their boats now we've been away for 12 years are you getting by with just a handheld GPS and plotting it out on a chart a an iPad a tablet a PC or do you have a built-in chart plotter what's working for people that are just starting out now and getting you by for navigation. So if you could leave that in the comments below what you use for electronics and for chart plotting, that'll be interesting to find out. Also, if you have any trouble hearing us in any of our videos, I hope you know that you can go into your YouTube settings and just go to the CC signal. And not only we have closed captions in English, but you can choose any language you want. Uh, well, within reason. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, thanks a lot for watching. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, if the video was worthwhile for you, if you can give it a thumbs up, that'll be a big help. And also, if you haven't already, a subscribe. So thanks a lot for watching. See you soon. <laughs>